We're going to talk about one of the objections of the society. Jesus can't be God because God cannot be seen, and yet Jesus was seen. And if I have time, I'll address John 17, 3. But what you need to do is keep praying for me, that God fills me with the wisdom and knowledge to keep bringing you these issues, to help equip you by the grace of God's Spirit for the glory of Christ to see Joe's witnesses get saved. Because apart from the Spirit, apart from the grace of Christ, I cannot do this. You guys ready? Put a one. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Let me give you the link. Here's the link, and I'm going to let I'm going to let them read the article for you. They have a feature in which someone reads the article. Here goes. Here's why Jesus cannot be God according to the society. All right? Jesus cannot be God. I'm posting the same link three times. Now watch. Let's listen in. You ready? The Bible's viewpoint. Jesus. Is Jesus God? No man has seen God at any time. John 1.18 what people say. Many people believe that Jesus is not God. Still, others point to Bible verses that supposedly indicate that Jesus is equal to God. What the Bible says. The Bible does not portray Jesus as being Almighty God or equal to God. The Bible does not portray Jesus as being Almighty God or equal to God. On the contrary, it clearly teaches that Jesus is inferior to God. For example, the Bible records Jesus' own words, The Father is greater than I am. John 14, 28. The Bible also says, No man has seen God at any time. John 1, 18. Jesus cannot be God because many people did, in fact, see Jesus. Jesus' early followers did not claim that he was God. For example, the Gospel writer John said, concerning the things he recorded, These have been written down, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. John 20, 31. The footnote reads, The Bible does not teach that God has a literal wife with whom he has fathered children. Rather, it calls Jesus the Son of God because Jesus was created directly by God, having qualities similar to those of his father. In the footnote. Okay, now, before I begin, Carol, our sister, has volunteered to post verses for me to make it easier, and Millie will record and edit this and then make it available on the YouTube page. So, praise the Lord Jesus for these two wonderful sisters who are serving us for the sake of Christ. Carol, here's the link. That's the link to the New World Translation. I'm going to answer their objection that Christ cannot be God because God cannot be seen, and yet Jesus was seen. For those of you who want to read the New World Translation online for free, there's a link. I posted it three times. Now, let me give you the link to this article again. Because it goes on to talk about when, when was Jesus born, which is not relevant to our discussion right now. Here's the link to their article. Did everyone understand their objection? They presented <clears throat> three objections to why Jesus can't be God. Number one, Jesus said the Father is greater than I. We'll address that. I've, ad I've actually addressed it. I have a video on it, a 15-minute clip on YouTube that David Wood uh, recorded for me years ago. So, Lord willing, you can, uh, you can go watch it, or I can answer that again a little later. But what I want to focus on is the claim that God cannot be seen, according to John 1.18. Now, Carol, are you there, sister? All right. Now, our sister is going to post from the New World Translation, because remember, the point of this room is to show you how to use their Bible to prove your point. Quoting the King James Bible won't prove your point because they're going to reject the King James any time it contradicts their perversion that they call a translation. So I'm trying to equip you by the grace of God's Spirit to learn how to use their Bible to your advantage. So we're going to be using their Bible. I will note when they mistranslate something and how you can show them that their society did mistranslate something. But we're going to challenge this assertion. Does the Bible teach that God cannot be seen in any sense? Notice what I said. Does the Bible teach that God cannot be seen in any sense, so that if Jesus is seen, he cannot be God? Let's go to John 1.18 and read what they conveniently omitted. Because you remember, they only quote the part that says, No man has seen God at any time. But now, let's see what their translation says in context, as Carol posted for me. John 1.18. John 1.18. Okay, now, notice their translation, saints. No man has seen God at any time. That's where they stopped. 
Well, let's continue. The only begotten God, now notice they conveniently put the word God in lowercase g. I'll get to that. Who is at the Father's side is the one who has explained him. Now, there's one of two ways to understand this passage. Number one, it can be saying that no one has seen God the Father at any time. This is the position taken by Trinitarians like Matt Slick, as well as James White. No man has seen God at any time, meaning no one has seen the Father at any time. But the only begotten God, Monogenes Theos, who is at the Father's side or in the bosom of the Father, is one who has explained him. That's one interpretation. The other way to interpret this passage is to understand that what John is saying is that no one has understood or perceived the nature of God. Not that no one has seen God in visible form, but no one has been able to discover and understand and comprehend who and what God is, which is why the Son came to explain Him. Did you catch it? The Son comes to explain Him. That word explain is where we get the word exegesis. If you go back and look at the Greek word, it's the same word where we get exegesis. Exegete. Exegesis means to bring out the meaning right, of a passage when it talks about the Bible. So here it's basically saying that the Son exegetes the Father, explains the Father, helps us understand who and what the Father is, or more correctly, helps us understand what the Godhead is like, what God is like. So now notice, there are two possible interpretations of this passage. One, it can mean that no one has seen God the Father visibly. Now, now why am I saying God the Father? Because if you read the second part of the sentence, after it says, no man has seen God any time, it says, the only begotten God who is at the Father's side is the one who has explained Him. Who's Him? The Father. The Son has explained the Father because no one has seen the Father. Or it can mean, no one has understood, comprehended the essence of the Father because the essence of the Father is the very nature of God. So Christ comes to help us understand and comprehend who and what God is like? Those are the two possible interpretations. Are you with me? Does it understand what these passages are saying? Okay. Let's go with the first interpretation. Let's take interpretation number one. This means no one has ever seen God the Father. Let's go with that interpretation. This is actually the position of Matt Slick and others. Now... The Jehovah's Witnesses are going to have a problem. Either interpretation is going to create major problems for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Now here's why. Carol, do me a favor. Go to Exodus 24 and read for me verses 1 to 2. Post verses 1 to 2. Exodus 24, from their translation, verses 1 to 2, and then 24, 9 to 11. But first put 24, 1 to 2. Hope this is going to bless you guys, because you're trying to use their Bible to prove your position. All right. Then he said to Moses, go up to Jehovah, you and Aaron, Jehovah, you and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and bow down from, and bow down from a distance. Now watch this. Moses should approach Jehovah by himself, but the others should not approach, and the people should not go up with him. So notice he's saying the people are going to remain at a distance from the mount, but Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and some of the others will get closer. They'll go up by the foot of the mount to get a more clear view of Jehovah. But Moses alone will approach Jehovah. Now watch what happens. Do me a favor. Carol, post Exodus 24, 9, 11. 9 to 11. Watch here. Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of, the, of Israel went up. Now watch this. They saw the God of Israel. What? No one has seen God? They saw the God of Israel. This is their translation. They saw the God of Israel. Hmm. Under his feet. Wow. So they also saw his feet. And they saw under his feet what seemed like a sapphire pavement. And it was as pure as the heavens themselves. Hmm. He did not harm the distinguished men of Israel, and they saw a vision of the true God and ate and drank. Now here's where the, the, the society <clears throat> acted deceptively. Do you see where it says they saw a vision of the true God? The words a vision of are not in the Hebrew text. 
The Hebrew does not have the words a vision of. They deliberately added these words in order to mask over the fact that Jehovah appeared in time and space at a specific location on earth in full visible view of Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel. Right? You can easily prove to them the word a vision of is not there. You know how? You know how you do it? You got to download, you have to download their free JW library app for your iPad or your iPhone. I have it with me. Once you do, this is what you're going to do. Let me show you how to get it. You got to go to the main site. Let me get there, get you to the main site. Hold on, guys. Let me get you to the main site. And I'm going to tell you how to get this, okay? Go to the main site. You have to download this. You have to. All right. Go here. Go to the bottom of the page. Bottom of the page, you're going to see it says JW Library App. I have it on my iPhone. JW Library App. Okay, here goes the link to it. Once you download it, you go to the Bible. You go to Exodus 2411. You click on the number 11. What happens is another page opens up, and it gives you multiple translations to compare. It gives you their 1984 reference edition. That gives you their 1984 edition. And then it gives you the King James Version, the American Standard Version, and the Byington Version. Now, the Byington Version you can find on online and download as a PDF file. American Standard Version and King James Version you can find on BibleGateway.com. One of many. Then you have also other Bible, you know, <clears throat> online resources. BibleGateway.com. Let's see how the King James Version translates the verse. You use the very versions that they make available free of charge on their app to show them that the society added the words a vision of. Here it is in the King James Version. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. In fact, the very first part of the verse shows you that this appearance of God must have taken place in time and space because it says he did not lay his hand upon them. Now, why would the author say that? Because the Israelites believed that if you saw God, you would be put to death. To see God is to die. But here the text is saying God in his mercy did not cause them to die because he wanted them to see him. Are you with me there? Everyone with me there? Just want to make sure you're following along. Now, how does the American Standard Version translate this? How does the American Standard Version render this? Their very Bibles that they use, here you go, American Standard Version. American Standard Version. Exodus 24, 11, And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, and they beheld God, and did eat and drink. Wow! You're telling me Exodus 24, 9, 11 says, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, 70 elders of the Israel of Israel, saw the God of Israel and saw his feet and saw what looked like pavement under his feet. They saw God and ate in his presence. Is that what Exodus 24, 9, 11 says? Now let's read their version again. Carol, again post Exodus 24, 9, 11 from their version. Watch this. Moses and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders of, the, of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. Wow saw the God of Israel. doesn't say they saw an angel. Don't let them tell you it's an angel, like, you know, Gabriel or someone. Saw the God of Israel, unless they want to say Gabriel is the God of Israel, right? Saw the God of Israel. Hmm. But John 1, 18 says no one can see God. No one has seen God at any time. What's going on here? Now, second point to remember. Let's assume the word vision of the true God is in the Hebrew text. That still doesn't do anything to help their case. Do you know why? Because John 1.18 doesn't say, no one can see God unless it's in a vision. It simply says, no one has seen God, period. Vision or not. Are you with me? So if they're going to say, oh, no, no, people can see God in a vision, that's not what John 1.18 said. John 1.18 simply said, no one has seen God at all, period. Whether in a vision or not, period. End of story. So even if we accept that the word a vision is in the Hebrew text, they still have a problem. Because John 1.18 doesn't qualify it. It doesn't say, you cannot see God unless it's in a vision. It says, no one has seen God at any time, period, end of story. 
Is that with me? Now you see the problem, right? Right there, this obliterates their argument. Because if God can be seen, then to say that Jesus can't be God because people saw him is irrelevant, right? It doesn't prove anything, does it? Right? Because here's an example where the God of Israel is seen. Well, if they can see the God of Israel, why can't Jesus be God and people see him veiling his glory in human form when the God of Israel is seen? You get the point? So there goes their objection. But wait, it's going to get even worse for them. Carol, I want you to do me a favor. Although the 70 elders and Aaron, Nadab, Abihu were allowed to see God visibly in a much more clear way than the Israelites were, who remained a, at a distance, Moses was given a privilege not given to the rest of them. He was actually allowed to enter the cloud and see God face to face in his form, that visible form. Let's read the rest of it. Do me a favor, Carol. Post 12 to 18, the rest of it. Let's read 12 to 18. Okay, read with me. Remember, the Israelites were not allowed to see God, God's visible form. They're allowed to see the cloud and hear his voice, but they did not see a visible form. That was given, that privilege was given to Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 elders. They're allowed to see a vis the visible form of God more clearly. But then God allowed Moses access to his very, very presence in the cloud, something he did not give to the rest of the elders, or Aaron, or Nadab, Abihu. Watch. Jehovah now said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay there. I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment that I will write for their instruction. So Moses got up with his attendant, Joshua. <clears throat> and Moses went up the mountain of the true God. But to the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we return to you. You have Aaron and Hur with you. Whoever has a legal case may go to them. Then Moses went up the mountain while the cloud was covering it. Now watch what happens, 16 and 18. Jehovah's glory remained on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. Now notice, Moses has to wait patiently for six days, six more days, before he can enter the cloud. Now when does he enter the cloud? On the seventh day, he called to Moses, the day of rest, from the midst of the cloud. To the Israelites who were watching, the appearance of Jehovah's glory was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. Notice, the multitude of people, all they saw was fire. They didn't get to see God's visible form, where he manifested with feet and a pavement under his feet. Moses then entered into the cloud and went up. Moses stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Did you catch it? Moses alone was allowed to enter into the cloud, and he remained inside the cloud with Jehovah for 40 days and 40 nights. You with me there? Now, what did he see when he was in that cloud? What did he see when he was in that cloud? Let's see. Let's go to Numbers 12, 6 to 8. Numbers 12, 6 to 8. Now remember, we're using their translation, right? Carol, this is their translation, right? 2013 edition? It is tragic that the Jehovah's Witnesses think that the society interpret the Bible correctly and that they alone are able to interpret the Bible correctly. Notice Numbers 12, 6 to 8. Read this. This is when Jehovah comes down in the cloud to rebuke Aaron and Miriam for complaining against Moses. Watch this. He then said, Hear my words, please. If there was a prophet of Jehovah among you, I would make myself known to him in a vision, and I would speak to him in a dream. This proves it was not a vision. Guys, anyway, notice here. Exodus 24, 11 says, A vision of Jehovah, right? Numbers 12, 6 to 8 shows you it's a, it's a mistranslation. Why? Because notice what he says about Moses. He then said, hear my words, please. If there was a prophet of Jehovah among you, I would make myself known to him in a vision, and I would speak to him in a dream. But it is not that way with my servant Moses. Did you catch it? How then could the society translate Exodus, Exodus 24, 11 as a vision of God, when here God says, when it comes to Moses, I don't simply appear to him in a vision. He is being entrusted to all my house. Face to face I speak to him. Actually more literally, mouth to mouth I speak to him. Openly, not by riddles. And the appearance of Job is what he sees. Why then did you not fear to speak against my servant, against Moses? You guys catch it? Mouth to mouth I speak to Moses and he beholds the appearance of Jehovah. Hold on. 
If Exodus 24:11 says a vision of God is what Moses and the rest saw, then doesn't this contradict what Jehovah just said here? No, with Moses, I speak mouth to mouth, face to face, and he clearly sees the appearance of Jehovah. Not in a vision, but in time and space. Because Jehovah actually enters this world, appears in a specific location visibly to Moses. So this is more than a vision, right? Because a vision takes place in your mind, or it may take place before your eyes, no one else can see it. But when Jehovah appears in time and space, that's a different story. Because even the Israelites saw a cloud. They saw a cloud actually descend on a mount. That's an actual location in time and space. But they didn't see the form in the cloud, except Jehovah. Is everyone with me so far? So what did we learn? We learned that Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel saw Jehovah. They saw the God of Israel. They saw pavement underneath his feet. They saw the God of Israel and ate in his presence and they were not killed. Is there with me so far? Okay, wait. There are other examples. Amos chapter 9 verse 1. Let's see if other people saw Jehovah. Amos 9 verse 1. God appeared as a man, but only became a man when he was born from his blessed mother Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit and took on an additional human nature. Appearing as a man and becoming a man by nature are two different things. In the Old Testament, he appeared in human form, but didn't become man by nature. That only occurred once, when he was conceived and born to his blessed mother while she was a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Yep. Anyway, Amos 9.1, again, Jehovah Witness Bible. I saw Jehovah stationed above the altar, and he said, I saw who? Who did he see? I saw Jehovah. Hmm. No one can see God at any time. Amos saw Jehovah above the altar, and he heard Jehovah say, Strike that of the pillar, and the thresholds will shake. Cut them off at the head, and I will kill the last of them with the sword. No one who flees will get away, and no one trying to escape will succeed. Okay, so Amos saw Jehovah. Who else saw Jehovah? Micaiah. 1 Kings 22, 19 to 22. 1 Kings 22, 19 to 22. Using the New World Translation to prove your position. Right? 1 Kings 22, 19 and 22. Let's see. 1 Kings 22, 19 and 22. Micaiah then said, Therefore hear the word of Jehovah. I saw Jehovah sitting on his throne. Another person who saw Jehovah? Remember the passage didn't say, No one can see God at any time except in a vision or a dream. Doesn't qualify it. No one could see God any time, period. Whether in time and space, or in a vision or dream, no one has seen God, period. End of story. You with me there? Therefore, hear the word of Jehovah. I saw Jehovah sitting on his throne, and all the army of the heavens standing by him, to his right and to his left. Jehovah then said, Who will fool Ahab, so that he'll go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one was saying one thing, while another said something else. Then a spirit came forward and stood before Jehovah and said, I will fool him. Job asked him, how will you do it? He replied, I will go out and become a deceptive spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. So he said, you will fool him, and what is more, you'll be successful. Go out and do that. And now Job has put a deceptive spirit in the mouth of all these prophets of yours, but Job has declared calamity for you. Did you catch it? Micaiah saw Jehovah on a throne. That's a visible form. Amos saw Jehovah before the altar. That's a visible form. Moses sees Jehovah in time and space descend on a mount in a cloud and sees pavement beneath his feet. He enters the cloud and he beholds the appearance of Jehovah face to face. Any more examples? Yes, there is. Ezekiel 126 to 28. Ezekiel 126 to 28. I'm only going to use their translation. Only. Thank the Lord that our sister Millie is recording this because then she'll make it available on YouTube. I hope this is educational because it's also showing you how to use the Hebrew Bible to prove that God can appear in human form in anticipation of God actually becoming man. These are all precursors of the Incarnation, anticipating the Incarnation of our blessed Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives forever. And because He lives, we will live. Ezekiel 1, 26-28. Watch this. Above the expanse that was over their heads was what looked like a sapphire stone. 
and it resembled a throne. Watch. Ezekiel sees what looks like a throne. Sitting on the throne up above was someone whose res appearance resembled that of a human. Hmm. It looked like human. I saw something glowing like electrum that was like a fire radiating from what appeared to be his waist and upward. And from his waist down, I saw something that resembled fire. There was a brilliance all around him, like that of a rainbow in a cloud on a rainy day. That is how the surrounding brilliant light appeared. It was like the appearance of the glory of Jehovah. When I saw it, I fell face down and began to hear the voice of someone speaking. That this human appearance that was radiating, right, <clears throat> glowing, that this human appearance is Jehovah himself appearing in visible glory, is confirmed in chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Let's look at chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, because he goes on to tell us what that voice said. I heard a voice speaking. Well, let's see what that voice said. Ezekiel 2, 1 to 5. Amazing stuff, right? And this is their own translation. Let's see Ezekiel 2, 1 to 5. Watch. He then said to me, the voice that he that spoke to him, He then said to me, Son of man, stand up on your feet that I may speak with you. When he spoke to me, spirit came into me and made me stand up on my feet. Notice this other deliberate mistranslation. Spirit came into me. It's actually the spirit came into me. Meaning God's Holy Spirit entered Ezekiel in order to enable him to hear from God, to give him the strength to stand before God. So notice even the Old Testament saints were aware they needed the Holy Spirit to experience God and to hear from Him. Spirit came into me and made me stand upon my feet. Made me. Notice the Spirit is somewhat personal. Do you catch it? Because the Spirit made me stand on my feet so that I could hear the one speaking to me. <clears throat> he went on to say to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the people of Israel. Notice, I am sending you to the people of Israel. Turbulent nations that have rebelled against me. Can it be any clearer that this is Jehovah? Well, here it's not the Spirit speaking. It's the Spirit empowering, enabling Ezekiel to hear from Jehovah. But the very fact that the Spirit made him do something shows that the Spirit has volition, has will, right? He decides what you do and then gives you the strength to do it. Anyway, follow with me. This is Jehovah speaking, not the Spirit. There are passages in Ezekiel where the Spirit is speaking, like Ezekiel 11.5. But let's stay focused. Son of man, I'm sending you to the people of Israel, to rebellious nations that have rebelled against me. So that human appearance that was glowing, blazing, that Ezekiel said it was the glory of Jehovah, that human appearance is speaking and he says that Israel and the nations rebelled against me. They and their forefathers have transgressed against me down to this very day. I am sending you to sons who are defiant and hard-hearted, and you must say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord Jehovah says. Did you catch it? Who did he see? Who is this human appearance of? The glory of Jehovah, right? But the glory of Jehovah means Jehovah appearing visibly. So hold on. How many people thus far have seen Jehovah visibly? Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, the 70 elders of Israel. That's 74 people, right? Micaiah, 75. Ezekiel, 76. Amos, 77 individuals thus far saw Jehovah in visible form, right? Yep, I was going to save the best for last. We're going to go to Isaiah next. Isaiah 6, 1 to 5. From their translation. Here's 78. Now there's more than 78, but you, you, you follow the, my drift. 78. Isaiah 6, 1 to 5 from their translation. We'll see it here. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw, I saw, yep, Jeremiah did too, Jehovah, sitting on a lofty and elevated throne. And the skirts of his robe filled the temple. I saw him on a throne, and he saw his skirts. So this is a vis visible appearance. He saw Jehovah wearing a skirt, right? Or the, the skirts of his robe, seeing him wearing a robe, right? I saw Jehovah sitting on a lofty and elevated throne, and the skirts of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were standing above him, each had six wings. Each covered his face with two, and covered his feet with two, and each, well, each of them would fly about with two. Watch here. Isaiah 6, 1 and 2 thus far. There's 5. And one called the other, Holy, 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 is Jehovah of armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. That's what the full verse says. Keep going, sister. Now, 4 and 5. Now, see if you can post an entire verse. Yep, he did. 
And the pivots of the thresholds quivered at the sound of the shouting, and the house was filled with smoke. Now watch here in verse 5. Yep, it's being recorded. Watch here in verse 5, saints. This is Isaiah 6, 5. All right. I'm waiting for her to post all of it. Here goes. Verse 5. I am as good as dead. Woe to me, Isaiah said. I am as good as dead, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes, if it couldn't be any clearer, the New World Translation renders Isaiah 6, 5 in the following. For my eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of armies himself. Jehovah of armies himself. For my eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of armies himself. Doesn't say an angel. Doesn't say Gabriel. Doesn't say Michael. It says, my eyes, my own eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of armies himself. So now, what about John 1, 18, though? No one has seen God at any time. Therefore, Jesus can't be God because people saw Jesus. But hold on. Isaiah saw Jehovah with his own eyes. Ezekiel saw Jehovah <clears throat> with his own eyes. Micaiah saw Jehovah with his own eyes. Moses, Nadab, Abihu, the seventy elders saw Jehovah, the God of Israel. They saw his feet and pavement under his feet and ate in his presence. Okay. But no one has seen God at any time. According to their position, this means Jehovah can't be God. If no one has seen God at any time, and therefore Jesus can't be God because Jesus was seen, then Jehovah can't be God because Jehovah was seen. So they've just proven Jehovah's not God. You catch the point? They just proved Jehovah's not God because Jehovah, the God of Israel, was seen. Because the God of Israel is Jehovah. So God can't be seen, but Jehovah, the God of Israel, was seen, therefore Jehovah can't be God. You with me there? Now, I don't have time to go through Genesis 18, but what I want you, to guys, want you guys to do, I want you to do this. Take a moment, read the entire chapter of Genesis 18. I'm going to step away and give you five minutes to do so. But I want you to use the New World Translation. Let me give you the link where you can read Genesis 18 from their own translation. I'm going to give you five minutes to read it, because the point is to use their translation. If you use another translation, it defeats the purpose. I'm trying to equip you, by the grace of God, to use their translation effectively. Okay, here goes. That's Genesis 18. Guys, I'm going to step away give you five minutes to read it, because this too, not 118, Genesis 18. Did everyone read Genesis 18 from the New World Translation? Yes or no? We're answering the objection. The New World Translation says, <clears throat> Jesus Christ cannot be God because he was seen, right? But according to John 18, God cannot be seen. Now, we read that verse in context from the New World Translation. What it actually says is that no one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who is at the Father's side, literally in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So there's two possible ways of translating that verse. Number one, what John is saying is no one has seen God the Father. Or number two, what it's actually saying is no one has understood or comprehended the nature of God the Father which is why Christ came to reveal God's nature to us so we can have a better understanding of who and what God is. Let's go with the first interpretation, that what John is saying is that no one has seen God the Father. You saw earlier today, verse upon verse, where Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, the 70 elders of Israel, Micaiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Amos, all of these men saw God saw Jehovah God visibly. Isaiah, Micaiah, <clears throat> and Ezekiel saw Jehovah God sitting on a throne. Amos saw Jehovah God standing by the altar. Moses saw Jehovah God appear in actual time and space at a specific location, at a specific mountain, in visible form, in a cloud. Right? No one has seen God, and yet many have seen God. Let did everyone read Genesis 18 from the New World Translation? Yes or no? Now let's read the pertinent passages, because we can't quote the entire thing. Let's focus on the subject by the grace of God. No side texting unless it's to answer a question, ask a question, or glorify the Lord who is worthy of all praise. Genesis 18 says, three men showed up, one of whom was Jehovah. Jehovah appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. So Abraham looked up saw three men. 
these three men approached Abraham. Abraham bowed down to them, told them to sit, sit and have their feet washed and ate food. The three men ate food, human food, that Abraham cooked and had their feet washed. Three men appeared. They ate human food and they had feet that was so tangible it could be washed. One of the three men is Jehovah. The other two are angels, as I'm about to prove. But the point is, remember, Joe's Witnesses say, God the Father, who alone is Jehovah, has never been, been seen. Jehovah is the Father, the Father Jehovah, and he's never been seen. This is not a vision. This is an actual encounter in time and space where Abraham, like Moses, sees God actually appear to him in human form in time and space. And how do I know it? Because the others saw them too, like Sarah. She saw the men and heard them. In fact, at one point, Jehovah rebuked Sarah for laughing and doubting that Jehovah would give her a son sometime next year. She laughed. And Jehovah says, why does Sarah laugh? And she goes, I didn't laugh. And he goes, yes, you did. So on top of that, she thought she could lie to Jehovah and get away with it. And he rebuked her. Yes, you did. Right? Now, here's the, here's the relevant issue. Genesis 18, 20 to 22. Genesis 18, 20, 22. New World Translation, Genesis 18, 20 to 22. The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is indeed great, and their sin is very heavy. I will go down to see whether they are acting according to the outcry that has reached me, and if not, I can get to know it. Then the men left from there and went toward Sodom, but Jehovah remained with Abraham. Now notice what he just said. His next destination is Sodom. I'm going down to Sodom to confirm whether what I've heard about Sodom and Gomorrah is true. If not, then I'll know it. It says, the men left from there and went towards Sodom, but Jehovah remained with Abraham. Now notice, <clears throat> three men appeared, Jehovah remains behind, and the other men go to Sodom. Now, if we are right, if we are correct, that one of the three men is Jehovah, and if Jehovah remained behind, how many men initially showed up at Sodom, initially? If one of the three men is Jehovah and he remained behind, how many initially would have showed up and Jehovah remained behind and the others go to Sodom? How many men showed up at Sodom initially? Three or two? Three or two? Okay. Genesis 19, verses 1 to 3. Genesis 19, verses 1 to 3. This is all New World Translation. Genesis 19, verses 1 to 3. Watch here. We're almost done, saints. Bear with me. Genesis 19, 1 to 3. How many show up? at Sodom. Genesis 19, 1 to 3 from the New World Translation. The two angels arrived at Sodom by evening. Two angels, huh? So the two men are angels, huh? Two of the three men are angels. Two angels arrived at Sodom by evening, and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, now they didn't look like angels to him, they looked like men. He got up to meet them and bowed down with his face to the earth, and he said, please, my lords, Turn aside, please, into the house of your servant and stay overnight and have your feet washed. A second time where someone invites to wash their feet or have their feet washed. Then you may get up early and travel on your way. So he has no clue they're angels. To this they said, no, we will stay overnight in the public square. But he was so insistent with them that they went with him to his house. Then he made a feast for them and he baked unleavened bread and they ate. Notice a picture of the Exodus. They ate unleavened bread. Because Lot and his daughters made a hasty exit. Do you see a picture of the exodus to come? Like the Israelites, centuries later, they ate unleavened bread on the night that they left Egypt. Lot and his daughters were experiencing an exodus of their own. Do you see it? And he didn't even know it. Unleavened bread. Why in the world would he serve them unleavened bread? You got it. In fact, we're in Revelation 11.8. It calls Jerusalem where their Lord was crucified, Sodom and Egypt mystically. So notice, Sodom and Egypt are the names given to Israel, or Jerusalem, the capital of Israel, who had killed the Lord Jesus. You with me? You catch it? Anyway, three men showed up in Genesis 18. One of them is Jehovah. These three men appear in human form, so tangible, so real, that they have feet that can be washed and they can eat actual human food. Jehovah says, I'm going to go down to Sodom to see if what Sodom has done is true. Then it says, the men headed towards Sodom. Jehovah, Jehovah remained behind with Abraham. 
If Job was one of the three men, that means initially only two showed up at Sodom because the third man remained behind with Abraham, that third man being Jehovah. So how many initially show up at Sodom? How many showed up and who were they? Now that you see the text. How many showed up and who were they? Two showed up. What happened to the third man? Where was the third man? Let's go back to Genesis 18.22. Genesis 18.22. You got it, right? Now remember, this is the Jehovah Witness Bible, saints. This is the Jehovah Witness Bible. You need to know their Bible enough to be able to use these passages to show them the error of their theology. Let's go back to Genesis 18.22. Let's watch this. Watch here. Then the men left from there and went towards Sodom, but Jehovah remained with Abraham. And then Abraham tries to negotiate with Jehovah, getting Jehovah to promise not to destroy Sodom if there are righteous people there. So Abraham says, if there are 50 righteous, what will you do? And Jehovah says, I'll spare it for 50. And then Abraham keeps negotiating with Jehovah until he gets the number down to 10. But notice in verse 25, what Abraham says to that man who stood behind and remained with him. What does he say to that man who stood behind and remained with him while the other two men went to Sodom, who happened to be angels? Genesis 18, 25. This is the Jehovah's Witness Bible, saints. It is unthinkable that you would act like this, act in this manner by putting the righteous man to death with the wicked one. So the outcome for the righteous man and the wicked is the same. It is unthinkable of you. Will the judge of all the earth not do what is right? Will the judge of all the earth not do what is right? Is there any doubt this is God Almighty standing before him? Jehovah God appears as a man with two other men. Those two other men are angels. And Jehovah God, in the form of a man, with two other angels who appear as men, eats human food, has his feet washed, and he's standing physically before Abraham face to face. Let's stick with the wording of the text. Genesis 18, 1 and 2. Notice the wording of the text. Afterward, Jehovah appeared to him among the big trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance of the tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing some distance from him. Nowhere does it say three angels. It says three men. When two of the men leave, then it says in Genesis 19, two angels showed up because two of the three were angels, but one of the men was Jehovah, not an angel. Now, after Abraham gets Jehovah to promise that he'll spare Sodom if he finds ten righteous, notice what Genesis 18.33 says. What does it say? Okay, watch. When Jehovah finished speaking to Abraham, when Jehovah finished speaking to Abraham, he went his way, and Abraham returned to his place. Okay, could the text be any clearer that it was Jehovah who stood before Abraham as a man and spoke to Abraham? Could the text be any clearer? Did the text be any clearer? That it was Jehovah who appeared as a man, standing before Abraham, speaking to him directly face to face. And this is the world translation, right? Okay. Now do me a favor, Carol. Post Genesis 18, 22 and 33 together. Genesis 18, 22, because you're going to see why I'm taking my time with this one. This is the knockout one. 33, back to back, from the New World Translation of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Watch it. Now she's going to post 33, and we're going to make the connection. You're going to see why I'm taking so much time. Learn what not to say here, which is the, this is the reason why we have the room. Teach us what not to say and what to say and avoid mistakes. Now I'm waiting for it to post 33. Watch here. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Thank you, Mikey, I apologize. Read with me. Then the men left from there and went towards Sodom, but Jehovah remained with Abraham. When Jehovah finished speaking to Abraham, he went his way and Abraham returned to his place. Okay, clear as day, Jehovah remained with Abraham. When they finished speaking, Jehovah left, right? Clear as day. The question is, where did Jehovah say he was going to? Where was he going to? Where was he going to? Soldier said Sodom. How do we know? How do we know he's going to Sodom? Because he says, Jehovah left on his way. On his way where? Where did he go? Where was he going? He went his way, left on his way. Genesis 18, 20, 21 tells us. He goes, I'm going to go down to Sodom. So the next stop for Jehovah would be where? According to Genesis 18, 20, 21, saints, I want to just make sure you've got it. If you've got it, this is a knockout. 
The Jehovah's Witnesses have no way of refuting you if you understand how to present this by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus. Genesis 18, 20, 21, right? He's going down to Sodom to see if the outcry is true. Everyone there, right? Put a one if you see that. In Genesis 18, 20, 21, Jehovah's next stop would be Sodom and Gomorrah, not heaven. So he's going to stay on earth. And his next stop on earth is Sodom. You see it? Amen? All right. Because now you're going to see some fun. Genesis 19, 24 to 29. Genesis 19, 24 to 29. Pay attention to verse 24 and 27. Genesis 19, 24 to 29. Watch here. Genesis 19, 24 to 29. Watch what happens. Then Jehovah made it rain sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. It came from Jehovah from the heavens. I'm confused. I thought Jehovah's on earth. How could the fire come from Jehovah out of heaven if Jehovah's on earth? Then read 27. Now Abraham got up early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before Jehovah. Did you catch it? If there was any doubt that Jehovah was on earth, at a specific location on earth. Notice 27. Abraham got up early in the morning and went to the place where he had stood before Jehovah. Hmm. Jehovah's on earth at a certain place, and then he goes down to another place called Sodom. And while there at Sodom, Jehovah brought fire from Jehovah out of heavens. So you have a Jehovah on earth. Why does the text say, Abraham went to the place where he stood before Jehovah. If Jehovah wasn't actually on earth, why does the text say Jehovah's going to go down to Sodom if he wasn't actually on earth, <clears throat> standing face to face with Abraham? And notice Genesis 19.24. Genesis 19.24. Jehovah was on earth at Sodom, brought fire from Jehovah from heavens. Well, you think about it, soldier. Now, those of you who know the New Testament, who would be the Jehovah on earth bringing fire from Jehovah in heaven? Who come down, comes down on earth as judge? Who comes down on earth as judge? John 5, 22, 23 proves it. John 5, 22 says, Moreover, the Father judges no one, but is entrusted all judgment to the Son. John 5, 22, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. So who is judging Sodom and Gomorrah? John 5, 22, moreover, the Father judges no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Jehovah on earth brings judgment on Sodom by bringing fire from Jehovah out of heavens. Who is the Jehovah in heaven? According to the New Testament. Now, if we read the New Testament, who is the Jehovah on earth in human form? Who is that Jehovah appearing as a man, speaking to Abraham face to face? The Son. You got it, man. So we have Jehovah on earth, Jehovah in heaven. Jehovah on earth appears as a man, speaks directly to Abraham, and brings fire from Jehovah out of heaven. So you have one Jehovah in heaven, one Jehovah on earth. Jehovah on earth as a man, that's Jesus, bringing fire from Jehovah out of heaven, that's the Father. Father and Son. Do you see it? Are you with me there, guys? Are you with me there, saints? Do you see it? Do you see why I took so much time to unpack Genesis 18 and 19? Because if you understand the point, no job witness can tap dance around your argument. Of course they're going to make excuses. Of course they're going to try and explain it away. But you're praying by the Spirit that they can see how nonsensical, foolish their reply will be. Because there is no way of denying the clear teaching of Genesis 18, three men show up, one of whom is Jehovah. No doubt Jehovah appears as a man on earth at a specific place, appears to Abraham directly, speaks to him directly, eats the food that Abraham gives him, has his feet washed, so this human form is so tangible it can be touched, and through that human form he can actually eat human food. Then the next place he goes to is Sodom, and from Sodom he brings fire from Jehovah in heaven, and then Abraham goes to the place where he stood before Jehovah, leaving no doubt that Jehovah's actually on earth, at a specific place on earth, in human form. And yet, what was the argument? The newer translation, or I should say the Watchtower publication said, 
God has never been seen. God has never been seen. Jesus hasn't, has been seen, therefore Jesus isn't God. Now, how do you reconcile this if you're a Jehovah Witness? If <clears throat> Jehovah has been appearing left and right, visibly, in human form, throughout the Old Testament, he appeared visibly to Abraham, he appeared visibly to Jacob, he appeared visibly to Moses and the 70 elders, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, he appeared visibly to Ezekiel, visibly to Amos, visibly to Micaiah, visibly to Isaiah, right? And I didn't give you all the visible appearance of Jehovah. Yeah, there are texts where you see there are two distinct persons identified as God, whom we know from the Old Testament, or from the New Testament, is the Father and the Son. Yes, soldier, there are. But before I go there, are you with me? <clears throat> now, Rusty, why do you think I went out of my way to show you, Rusty, that in these passages it's not a vision? Because Jehovah is actually standing at a certain place, right, Rusty? Secondly, nowhere does it say the angel of Jehovah. Why do you think I chose these passages? Exodus 24 says the God of Israel. And you ask the Jehovah Witness, who is the God of Israel? Jehovah. Isaiah 6 says Jehovah. He saw Jehovah on the throne and his robe. Ezekiel 1 says this is the glory of Jehovah appearing in human form, glowing Right? And blazing. First Kings 22, 19 says, Micaiah saw Jehovah on the throne. Didn't say angel of Jehovah. Didn't say angel. It said Jehovah. Jehovah, Jehovah, the God of Israel. Why do you think I chose these passages, Rusty? So they don't tap dance around them by saying, oh, no, see, it says angel of Jehovah. So this angel represents Jehovah. That's why he can be called Jehovah. Nowhere did it say angel of Jehovah, did it? For all of you with eyes to see and ears to hear, by the grace of God, do you see from their own translation, Jehovah himself is appearing on earth in human form to the patriarchs like Abraham. And then that Jehovah on earth brought fire from another Jehovah out of the heavens. Clear as day, right? Is that clear? Let's go back to the question, though. John 1.18. Let's post John 1.18 from their translation. Yes, an amazing God. John 1.18. Let's go to their translation again. Now that we've looked at all these examples, let's see what we discover. No man has seen God at any time. Notice, any time, right? Would this include the Old Testament time as well? No man has seen God at any time. Any time, wouldn't that include the Old Testament period as well? Okay, now, my question then is, who is this Jehovah God that was seen by the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, by Moses, by Micaiah, by Isaiah, by Ezekiel, right, by Amos. Who was the God that was seen? You got it. That's what John 1.18 said, right? No one has seen God at any time, but it is the only begotten God who revealed him, who explained him, who made him known. Well, if they haven't seen God at any time, and it's the role of the Son with the Holy Spirit, mind you, along with the Holy Spirit, not to the exclusion of the Holy Spirit, right, it's the role of the Son to reveal Jehovah to people, then doesn't this prove that the Son has been active from the very beginning in revealing Jehovah to people even during the Old Testament period? Right? Isn't that clear? Okay, but now here's my question, though. What kind of God appeared to Moses in Exodus 24? Did it say a God or the God of Israel in Exodus 24, 9, 11? What kind of God appeared to Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the seven elders? The God of Israel, right? Who is the God of Israel, according to Exodus 24, 9? Who is the God of Israel? What's his name? Jehovah, exactly. In Genesis 18, what God, what kind of God appeared to Abraham? Who appeared to Abraham? Jehovah, right? What God appeared to Micaiah? Jehovah, right? Jehovah, correct? What God appeared to Amos? Jehovah, right? Okay, what's my point? Since it's Jehovah who appeared to all these people, the God of Israel, how then can Jesus be a God, lowercase g, if he is Jehovah God Almighty who's been appearing to all the patriarchs? How can he be a God, lowercase g, if these passages are saying it's Jehovah, the God of Israel who appeared, and we know Jehovah's not a God, Jehovah's the God, the true God. 
And that happens to be Jesus. So how can Jesus be a God? If it's the true God, Jehovah will appear to them. So what does this do to their translation of John 1.18? Let's look at it again. Let's look at John 1.18 one more time. Let's see how they translated it. They translated only begotten God and put the, the letter G in lowercase. So are they trying to tell us that Jehovah will appear to Abraham, to Isaac and Jacob, to Moses, the elders, to Micaiah, to Isaiah, to Ezekiel, to Amos? Is a God, lowercase g, is that what they want us to believe? So they want us to believe that Jehovah is a God? Well, that's what they want us to believe if we take this translation literally. Because this translation says it's the only begotten God, lowercase g, who revealed him. But the one who was revealing God to the patriarchs, to Moses, and to Isaiah, and to Ezekiel, was Jehovah Almighty. How can Jehovah Almighty be a lowercase g God? You see where I'm going with this? You see how the Old Testament proves that they butchered John 1.18? The word theos there should not be translated as God, lowercase g. The word theos there in 118 should be translated as God, capital G. Because that's the God who appeared to them, God Almighty himself, Jehovah, who ended up becoming flesh, whom we now know as Jesus Christ. Do you want further proof it was Jesus that appeared to Abraham as Jehovah? Do you guys want further proof? John 8, 39 to 40. I'm going to have to answer their other question maybe in another session. John 8, 39 to 40, because I think I'll end it with this. <clears throat> I think I've given you at least some ammunition from their translation for the next time you see them. Use it prayerfully and ask them questions. Don't pontificate. Don't tell them what the passages mean. Present it in a form of a question. How can you say that God cannot be seen? Look at all these verses from your translation. It says Jehovah was seen, and it doesn't say angel. Right? Because they're trained to answer questions. When you present it as a question, you shake their entire system. Now watch here. John 8, 39 to 40. <clears throat> Read with me. In answer, they said to him, Our father is Abraham. Jesus said to them, If you are Abraham's children, you'd be doing the works of Abraham. Now watch this. This is their own translation. But now you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Abraham did not do what? He's proving to these Jews that they don't belong to Abraham. Abraham is not their father. They actually belong to Satan. And what's the proof? You don't act like Abraham. You're trying to kill me. Abraham did not do this. Abraham did not try to do what? Abraham did not do what? Read it. See. Kill who? Jesus? Well, how's that possible? This assumes that Abraham saw Jesus. And unlike the Jews, he didn't try to kill Jesus. Is that what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying that your father Abraham saw me, but his reaction was different from yours? When he saw me, he didn't try to kill me. When did Abraham see Jesus? When did Abraham see Jesus? Watch here. John 8, 56. Now, they're going to butcher the Greek, but that's okay. Yeah, it does, because they don't believe 753, 811 is part of the original gospel. They believe it's an interpolation. So the story of the woman caught in adultery, they removed it from their version. They don't believe it's part of the original. But I'm going to show you that, what, another reason why they left it. I'm going to show you something amazing from that one. Notice this, their translation, John 856. Abraham, your father, rejoiced greatly at the prospect of seeing my day, and he sought was glad re and rejoiced. You catch it? Notice the difference. You're trying to kill me. Abraham didn't. Because Abraham rejoiced to see me. Now, this can mean one of two things. I believe it has both meanings. It can mean that Abraham saw prophetically that God revealed to him that the Messiah would come and rejoice. And or it could mean that he actually saw Jesus face to face. I believe both meanings are present here. Not just receive the revelation of Christ coming, but actually seeing Christ face to face. How do I know? Because of 57. Notice how they understood Jesus. Look how the Jews understood him. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and still you have seen Abraham? You see how they understood him? They understood him to be meaning, to be implying, I actually saw Abraham. Not only did Abraham saw the coming of the Messiah, I actually saw Abraham face to face. That's how they understood his words. 
Now, they may have misunderstood him, so Jesus could have corrected them. Instead of correcting them, he goes on to show them, yes, I did see Abraham. Do you know why? Because unlike Abraham who came into being, right? Unlike Abraham who came into being, I've always been. Now, notice how they butcher John 8, 58. But even their butchering, you can still make your point. Post 8, 58. The actual Greek says, ego, I me. I am. Now, if you download their JW library app, you click on 58, they make available their Greek interlinear as part of the app for free. Download it. Click on 58. In the Greek interlinear, you're going to see ego aimi, and beneath it, the words I am. So even their Greek interlinear, which they use to translate, testifies that Jesus said, I am, not I have been. But you only see that if you download their JW library app for free from their website. Here goes again the link. You have to download it, saints. It's free for your iPad and your iPhone. Do it. But anyway, even with John 858, Carol, post it. John 858, post it one more time. Even here, it still makes the point. Jesus said to them, most truly I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. In other words, he's answering them, yes, I did see Abraham, because I'm older than 50. Looks can be deceiving. You think I'm not 50. I'm telling you, I've been around even before Abraham came into existence. That's why I could have seen Abraham. But then you ask the Jehovah's Witness, when did Abraham and Jesus see each other? See, this is where it's going to prove your point. So don't get stuck in an argument about whether it's I am or I have been. Right? Because here Jesus is confirming... I actually saw Abraham, he actually saw me. So then you tell them, when did Jesus see Abraham? And when did Abraham see Jesus? Now they have to show you, right? Genesis 18, Jehovah appeared to Abraham as a man. Excuse me, Mr. Witness, since God the Father has never been seen, who is this Jehovah that appeared to Abraham? Genesis 17, 1. Explain this to me, Mr. Witness. Genesis 17, 1. Post that for me, Carol. With 22, back to back. <clears throat> so even their translation will still make your point. Whether it's I am, I have been, it still makes the point. Because Jesus is confirming, yes, I actually saw Abraham because I'm older than 50. In fact, I was there even before your father came into being. So focus on that. Say, okay, when and where did Abraham see Jesus? Genesis 18, Job appeared to him as a man. Hmm. But the Father's never been seen. So who is this Jehovah that Abraham saw, spoke with, who ate food in human form? And then Genesis 17, 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, Jehovah appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Notice they'll tell you Jesus is a mighty God, but he's not the Almighty God. But hold on. Who is this Jehovah that appeared to Abraham who said, I am God Almighty? And then verse 22 says, when God finished speaking with him, he went up from Abraham. Oh, so he was down? So here's another reference to Jehovah coming down in actual time and space at his actual location. And then when he finished speaking with Abraham, he went up. Unlike Genesis 18, when he came down, he went to Sodom, then he went up. Here he came down, finished talking with Abraham, and went up again. <clears throat> up where? To heaven. Hmm. So is it clear from their translation Genesis 17, 1 and 22, Jehovah came down and appeared to Abraham and said, I am God Almighty. And then when he finished talking, he went up. Was that clear? Did you guys see it from their translation? Clear, right? But hold on. No one has seen God at any time, meaning the Father. Who was this Jehovah that Abraham saw if no one has seen God at any time? Who was this Jehovah that appeared to Abraham, according to the New Testament? Jesus? Now you destroy their argument. You know why? Because if that's Jesus, Jesus says he is God Almighty. But the society says Christ is never called Almighty. Yes, he is right here. Let's look at Genesis 17.1 again. 